um, welcome again for everyone. I am Bethany Schramer with Oregon Ask, Oregon After School and Summer for Kids. Um, just helping facilitate this call uh, around summer day camp and um, really a discussion on what's to come. Thanks everyone for sharing your questions. We passed along as many as possible in a slightly consolidated manner to Oregon Health Authority and the governor's office um, ahead of time. But hoping that we'll have time today for people to share also vocally um, thoughts and discussions. We'll have a couple of opportunities for um, people for a, a poll and, um, and there'll be uh, actually a survey link that we share out. Make sure you have all are all aware of the funding opportunity that is, is just currently out. So I think with that, um, Alyssa, are you ready for me to introduce you or did we wanna give people a couple more minutes to jump in? Um, I'm, I'm ready. I think we've got our OHA colleagues on as well. So ready when you are. Great. I think we'll, we'll go ahead again. If you um, are just joining us, you can put your um, rename yourself and or introduce yourself in the chat box to make sure that we've got your contact information. We know who's asking questions as we go. Um, we'll do our best to grab your questions and, and get them um, put aside so that we can make sure we get answers to them. But um, the, the next slide gives just kind of the topics that I had shared had come up um, that I think Alyssa will share a little bit of context and then we'll be able to dive into questions. So off to you, Alyssa. Great, thank you. It's great to see some familiar names and faces. It's been a while since we've all been together. So nice to see you all and appreciate you making the time. Um, so we have gotten the questions. Thank you, Bethany, for pulling all of those together um, and are working those through our team. Um, I think today I was hoping mostly to kind of hear from you all um, about what you need to see. Obviously, you need to know if camps can operate and in what capacity. Um, I would say right now what we have done is we took the summer camp, day camp guidance that we had last summer and sort of adapted them uh, to what we're calling the youth program guidance. Um, and I would say we're not, um, we've not made any decisions and we really want to try to create space for you all to give us your feedback and input, make sure um, we're aware of where you need additional guidance, what's working in the youth program guidance, what isn't. Some of that um, is, is clear just in the questions that were shared, um, but, but really wanted this to be kind of a starting point for conversation so that our office, um, for all of you who don't know, Alyssa Chatterjee, Deputy Education Policy Advisor in the Governor's Office, but we're working closely with OHA um, on developing all of this guidance. So um, as Bethany mentioned, um, there is some funding available. So um, the start of the year, the uh, Emergency Board of the Legislature set aside about $10 million um, and the intention was, was to support um, sort of the summer camp infrastructure um, that we know has been impacted by COVID. We know many of you haven't been eligible for the other grant opportunities that have been made available, uh, the emergency child care grants and things of that nature. And we also recognize that um, camps serve a really important function from a perspective of offering child care, you know, a place for kids to go that's safe and enriching um, during the summer. Um, and we also know that you've all been very disproportionately impacted um, since last summer. We know that there are some of you that weren't able to operate at all. So there is $10 million set aside for that. We're continuing to work um, on our end to make sure that the legislature agrees with sort of the distribution methodology and all of that. But I know Bethany has a link um, that will be shared. So if any of you are interested in that, fill out the survey. It's what we're gonna be using to kind of help us determine next steps in terms of award amounts and funding formulas. And I would also invite Marissa, I think if there's anything you wanna add um, in terms of what would be helpful or anything you'd like to call out, please jump in. Uh, thank you, um, Alyssa. The Oregon Alliance of YMCA's is really grateful to, for the opportunity to help facilitate this and make sure all of the summer camps, day camps and overnight camps get the 
support that they need in, uh, as quickly as we can get it in their, in their hands. So um, we're going to have a really quick turnaround. So everybody who has applied already, please do not submit again. That's important because we don't need to have to sort through all the duplications. Uh, and if you're not sure, just ask others on your staff. So we don't need multiple um, applications. And uh, please be on the alert that you may be sent a follow-up questionnaire for some additional information that we might need, particularly on how we are meeting um, uh, the needs of underserved populations and, and looking at things from an equity lens. So thank you all for quickly responding and being patient once we know what our guidelines are. Thanks, Marissa. I'm seeing a couple of questions in the chat. Yes, so thanks, Bethany. February 5th is the new deadline. This originally um, was, I believe, supposed to close on January 18th. So we've extended that date to tomorrow. Um, and again, as Marissa said, if you think someone in your organization has applied, please check first. Um, but you'll need to fill out this survey in order to be um, considered for these funds. Part of that is so that we can get these dollars out to you all as quickly as possible, as Marissa mentioned. Um, if we, so we need to be able to kind of know what universe we're talking about and all of the programs that need resources so we can start to get those out the door. Um, so I'll try to keep an eye on the chat too. And Bethany, feel free to just kind of jump in if, if there's more questions about that operationally. Um, so what would be helpful, Bethany? Do you want to kind of go through some of the questions that you've captured? Yeah, and the, the next slide has a couple of like big questions that I thought would help frame like what what has changed, you know, what do you know since last year and um, is there a chance things will really change in the next couple months as we are preparing for the summer. Yeah, so I can say at a very high level and then I'll ask um, if any of my OHA colleagues um, would feel comfortable jumping in. I think we know um, that we're on a, a good trend in terms of case rates across the state, which is really exciting. Um, and we know that things were better last summer, so we're hoping that's what we're heading towards um, looking in, into this summer. Obviously, no crystal ball. We don't know what's going to happen between now and June. But I think, you know, our hope would be that at the very least, we're, op we're allowing summer camps to operate as they did last summer. To me, that's kind of the hopeful bare minimum if we're not also able to expand um, and make adjustments to potentially cohort requirements. Um, I know we're, we are, of course, talking about what can happen with overnight camps as well. Um, so this is really a great opportunity to kind of hear from you and for OHA to hear from you directly as well about um, what you kind of need timeline-wise, guidance-wise to be ready but um, uh, Shira or Alana or um, Dr. Jean, is there anything that you would want to share in terms of what we've learned since last summer? Hi, well, this is Tom. I mean, I think in general, we've learned a lot about um, congregate settings, uh, including schools and, and camps. Um, I think, you know, regarding that second bullet point, I think we are still seeing publications and, and kind of research and experiences from around the world coming in, uh, including from last summer and, and fall. Um, so I think there, I don't know if it's a strong likelihood, but we will have, I think, more, more evidence coming, coming on. But um, I think we're at the point now where we need to, to look at the, the very latest literature and get a sense for uh, what specific to camps uh, can we point to? Because right now we've, we've, we're pretty familiar with the literature around schools and, and the general idea that schools are really not a hotspot for transmission, assuming that um, uh, preventive measures are in place um, in terms of masking and cohorting and things like that. So I think a lot of that will apply to schools, but if, or sorry, to camps, but it, uh, there are obviously some significant differences as well. Thanks, Tom. Does and that I, sufficient for these questions? Yeah, please, Bethany. Yeah, I guess I was just going to say, I know there was a call from um, that you listened in, Alyssa, with some data around camp information from last year that had been collected. And um, so I'm, I'm hoping that we make sure that gets passed along and discussed in, in the creating of um, potentially separate guidance for overnight camps and what that means for there is a number of questions coming up around 
you know, mask use and social distancing and being outdoors and stable cohort versus um, like within your stable cohort or not. So um, just wanted to uh, be aware if there was also going to play into that uh, vaccinations. So that was one of our first topics on the next slide is how would testing and vaccinations work into the potential for guidance? You know, would it be dependent on if testing or vaccines could be required or administered? Um, and so it, I know things are going to be constantly changing in that realm as well, but um, just some any more info you can provide on that would be great. Yeah, uh, so we, yes, the data that was shared um, by the ACA has been passed on to OHA as well so that they can review that. Um, and I would say, I don't know, Tom or Sharon Alana, is, if there's a general approach OHA is taking with guidance now that vaccines are starting to roll out just kind of generally, I know we haven't talked about this specific to summer camps. Well, um, you know, at this point in time, uh, vaccinations aren't changing a lot of, of our guidance recommendations. Um, I think that will happen further down the road once we're getting, you know, closer to uh, herd immunity and having, you know, a majority of people vaccinated, but that's, that's still a ways off. But certainly vaccination is, or, and vaccines are, are included in our um, guidance and, and considerations. And, and Laura's question over here on the side is vaccines still have not been approved for youth. Is, is that correct? So. Well, um, none of them have been approved, uh, just to be technical. They have emergency use authorization. Um, and one of the two, I forget which, which it is, um, was actually studied in um, ages 16 and up. So uh, some of the older, older children, adolescents would, would actually be um, under the EUA from the FDA currently. And that would be Pfizer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. And so, um, yes, one of the questions that did come up that I, I think we've heard um, positively around, but I'm not sure if, um, vac if camps would be considered within the education and child care sector um, and what's the likelihood and schedule, if that is true, of getting ensuring that people can get the necessary information and, and signed up. Yeah, so it's a little tricky. I would say in our estimates, um, programs that have been operating, you know, especially whether you're on a school location or you work with a school, those were captured in um, the numbers that school districts put together and shared with us. Um, if you are um, an emergency child care provider, those were captured in the numbers that the early learning division put together. Um, for programs that have solely been summer camps, those are not currently captured in the definition of educator in terms of how we're prioritizing vaccine rollout now. Um, but we do kind of have it to make sure that we are calling out when folks could kind of fall, whether that category gets broadened um, or where it would kind of fall down the road. Um, since we have such limited availability of vaccine, our priority has really been um, folks who are currently caring for kids um, and, and getting our kids back to um, physical in-person school. So that's, that was sort of the um, defining characteristic, but we do know that that um, summer camps are obviously a critical component to the system. So they are on our radar. And then, um, so on to, I guess, some more questions. There's There was a, a lengthier list of vaccine questions I can give you if you would like, but um, there is certainly this question around, will there be guidance uh, specifically around protocol for either requesting or um, if there, you know, you've said there's not any difference currently in guidance based on vaccination or testing policies, but I know that even last year there was a number of programs that really wanted to be able to ask for testing in order to be able to demonstrate, you know, there might have been less stringent requirements on youth in that program, perhaps, let's say. So um, is there a consideration for that this summer. Uh, and are you, were you referring to vaccination or testing? I'm sorry. 
I guess either or. I know that vaccines are limited and that I don't, we don't know that there would be those uh, available. So at the least, could testing be an alternative for demonstrating that there wasn't, you know, that there was limited exposure possibilities? Yeah, well, it's a really good question. And certainly a lot of um, settings around the country have, have been trying to use testing. I, I think in different ways, vaccination and testing are both, um, you know, kind of one of those layers of protection. We talk about like slices of Swiss cheese and they all have holes, but you put a bunch of them together and you're going to start to to really block things. Um, the only the complication with testing is that um, most of the tests, um, almost all of the tests really haven't been well studied in people without symptoms. And, and yet a lot of people want to use them for screening and say, well, we want to test these people who look healthy to make sure they're healthy. And the, the problem is you can't fully trust a negative result in somebody like that. Um, and so uh, the answer is yes, I think we will be, I think testing considerations are important and they can play a role, but um, to date, we've been a little bit um, reluctant to, to, to point to testing as, you know, a way to ensure anything. Um, and, you know, there, there have been plenty of examples of settings where people used, uh, were, were tested before an event, and, and then there was a large spreader event. So, um, but, but again, as part of a, large, uh, a larger program with all sorts of different preventive measures in place, testing can play a role for sure. And vaccination, uh, I did not mean to imply that vaccination would not change our guidance at all, or that vaccination uh, doesn't make a huge difference because vaccination is of course the way out of the pandemic. So all these things are, are complicated and will be part of our consideration. So how's that for a wishy-washy answer? <laughs> um, I, I wanted to note that I put a link in the chat box. If people are willing um, and able to click on that link and fill out just this like two question, since I don't really like using Zoom polls since they normally malfunction, this was the alternative for being able to demonstrate some um, desires on cohort sizes and then the other question is around age groups. So both of those questions have already come up in our chat box today and came up dozens of times on the pre-survey of what's the likelihood that cohort size, stable group size could go up? Um, will that be dependent on age group? And will this summer day camp guidance like last summer cover everyone or will it remain a youth program Co like set and then a child care set. Hey Bethany, can you um, open up that Google form so we can access it? Sure can. But you know what? You're a rock star at multitasking. It is hopefully better now. Was Thank your you last part a question, Bethany, or is that more of kind of your framing for the survey? Uh, sorry, what, what was my last question or was that? Was, I couldn't tell if you were asking the question or if you're really just framing the survey for folks. Well, I, I mean, I would, we would love, I think people would love to know the answer to those if you know the answer. And then the survey hope, helping demonstrate there is clearly a desire for there to be larger cohorts. And I think for, so we'll see, you know, what people say as far as wanting one set for everyone, um, but just kind of where you lay currently, if this survey might have any um, sway in helping you determine if there is being responsive to the community. Yes, absolutely. The survey will be helpful. So thank you for uh, running that. We'll, we'll, we'll take a close look at the responses. Um, I don't think we can give an answer right now about cohort size. Um, you know, a lot of, in terms of uh, some of our other guidance and what's happening with children in schools and, and childcare, um, for most of those, we have, I believe, a 20 person cohort limit. Um, and some of the studies we've looked at recently in schools um, really demonstrating the, the low risk of that setting for transmission. Um, at least one of those had a cohort size of 20. Um, but again, overnight camps, especially it's a different, it's a different environment. So we'll, we'll just have to look at the, the latest evidence and, and make some decisions based on that. But yes, thank you for the opportunity to look at the, the, the feedback. 
And I think, um, so Katie, I don't know if you are able to pull up now the response sheet of that. Um, there's about a hundred responses. Um, I only gave three options on the cohort size, but it um, predominantly seems that people would love to see it align with the early child care guidance that has 20. And I know some of the conversations that had happened previously were really around how stable that stable cohort is and if it then is it's reasonable to allow these 20 kids to interact um, considering how frequently they may or may not change, you know, from one week to the next versus a childcare that is expected to go longer than a week. Um, and then with older youth being um, the, the data, right, at the time showing that younger youth, younger kids were less likely to spread. So is that a, a variant that is still on the table for having to require youth programs as they are now to have smaller cohorts. So, so a couple of things about the cohort versus staff, it, you know, and I'm, I'm also seeing this. So there's a, a comment here about cohorts and ECC guidance do not also required to keep kids socially distanced. That's not true. We are required to keep kids socially distanced and the ratio of staff to, to students is one to 15. So with 20 kids, you have to have two staff, which basically moves the ratio I mean, the cohort size down to, to 10. So it doesn't help necessarily unless everything can get aligned. Thanks, Clay. That's a great point. And I know that question was brought up um, around the language in ECC that um, asks for social distancing, but then it was indicated the way that they talk about creating activities assumed that you're not always socially distant. And I think there was some clarity, they were asking for clarity on, is it mandatory, is it recommended, and how does that play out in other settings? Yeah, well, when they, when they come in and do their monitoring of us, they're, they're looking for the six foot marks on the carpet, and they're looking for the six foot de desk spread. And so they, they're assuming that there's a six foot spread on all kids. So there's questions over, I know, on whether there will be an overnight camp. Um, question, Alyssa, did you want to address kind of where that is at currently and going forward? Yeah, so um, we are, we are I, I would say we're not taking anything off the table at this stage. We also know everybody needs an answer four months ago. So um, recognizing all of those realities, um, we have not made a determination about overnight camps. Um, we are looking at the ACA data that was put together um, on transmission in um, overnight camps versus day camps. And um, we'll be working with OHA closely to kind of determine what next steps could be around all um, summer programming, including overnight. So um, I know I don't want to commit to having an answer for you because we know things can change so much, especially in COVID times, but we are talking about um, whether overnight camps would be able to open and if so, how, and that'll kind of, I think, help us determine, are we utilizing or expanding summer camp guidance or will there need to be separate overnight camp guidance once we kind of know how these things would have to operate. And so I think to that point, there was um, certainly questions on um, what, what guidance do we follow? And if there is new guidance coming, when might, might we expect that? You know, can we plan ahead for summer based on, based on what? <laughs> yeah, I was like, we're not, there's not a firm answer yet. No, um, I mean, um, it, we're having, I know there were questions, we kind of went from the summer saying, you know, here's what summer camps are, it's basically school age, anything less than school age is childcare, and then we got into the fall, created youth program guidance, and suddenly anyone younger than 12 and older than five, so I know we've been inconsistent, and so I would say we've not kind of determined how we're going to take that information and move into the summer, um, but we are working on um, getting out as much information to everybody as soon as possible. Uh, we know you all need to be able to plan for the summer and be able to purchase what you need to purchase and staff how you need to staff. But we don't, I don't wanna commit us to a, a date and then let you all down. So I, I promise though to keep working with 
um, Bethany and our other partners as we keep kind of going through this process. And Bethany, I'm also happy as we're making this progress to get this group back together. I know we met several times heading into last summer, so happy to keep doing, uh, taking on that format. And I think then just um, a recognition and a hope that um, there will be an opportunity for for things to adjust as as we learn. There is a question here from Ken on is there a possibility essentially of moving back towards normal? Like, is there any possibility that masks will not be required in a camp setting this year? Thoughts on that? Well, that's a great question. Sorry, I was trying to find the mute button. Um, I think the, the likelihood of that is pretty low by the summer. I think it's going to be closer to, to fall um, or late late 2021 before we get really to that point. But again, this is, this is a guessing game and it depends a lot on how fast the vaccine really continues to be rolled out around the country and, and in Oregon. So I, I again, I think low, low likelihood of things looking normal, um, you know, no masks and all that this summer. Um, is that, would that also be true of outdoor settings? And so, um, you know, at some point last summer, I remember if you were six feet apart, you didn't, it didn't require a mask, um, if I remember correctly. Um, might that be true um, if there is outdoor setting? And maybe, you maybe don't know the answer, but I'll pose, I think that people would love to see that as an option that is discussed, that if when outside and socially distanced, there could be not required masks. And then I guess skipping ahead, would that be dependent on being in a county where risk level is low enough, or will this guidance be one for all? Yeah, so certainly if you're outside and you're far away from other people, you're alone or you're with somebody in your household only, that's very low risk. Um, I, I would guess I would have to defer to Alyssa in the governor's office because we do have, you know, kind of some pretty restrictive face covering guidance right now. Um, and so I'm not sure how that will play out with a summer camp setting where you certainly have groups of, of children and adults. Um, is there, is there an option if they're, they're kind of out doing their own thing for a period, can they take off their masks? Um, in, in general, I would say that's a pretty low risk and they, we wouldn't think that masks are needed, um, but we've, you know, there is the concern about the high risk county or the extreme risk counties and our current, um, our current guidelines for masking, which are pretty, pretty broad. Yeah, I would say I, I, I don't, anticipate that we would have um that we would set up situations without requiring face coverings but things continue to evolve um and so you know happy to carry that forward as we work through what the guidance will look like um moving forward yeah i think part of it is just the concern that you've got if you've got a group of of, of kids who are kind of playing independently spaced apart, how, how realistic is it for them to actually always be six feet apart? Um, so I think that's part of the, the concern there. Um, so there um, was a question over here from Jordan and a ditto on um, the Ready School Safe Learners has recommended small cohorts in the 24 to 36 student category, but these cohorts can are, are much smaller than that. Is there a reason for this very different set of recommendations? Um, I think it's something, and, and Tom, feel free to jump in. We will flag that. We continue to revise the youth program guidance so we can take that back um, and take a closer look and, and see if there's a way we can get closer alignment um, or circle back on why we need to remain at 10. And Shira and Alana, please feel free to jump into from the project management end of that if that sounds off in any way. That that twenty four. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that that lines up. Um, yeah, I mean we're we're constantly in contact with um, Tom and the other 
senior health advisors to figure this stuff out. And so um, always happy to hear the feedback about that to make sure that we're taking all of that stuff into consideration. So thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, I just wanted to add that in the, in the school guidance, there, there are many situations where that there is a smaller cohort limit given um, you know, the extreme risk counties and, and um, in, in really high risk counties, you know, 25 of our 36 counties are in that extreme risk still right now. Um, that it's not generally not recommended or there's going to be pretty limited in-person um, uh, learning happening. Um, and so the, the 24 or 36 kind of assumes a much lower level of spread uh, in general. But again, that was, uh, that's, that's been in place for quite a while. And so we'll, we'll evaluate that again as we look at uh, outdoor camp guidance. And just to note, it was brought up, not all camps are outdoors. Thank you, Robert. Yes, so especially noting on that one, um, like performing arts. And so being able to be on a stage for a performance, um, I, I think that has, it may have come up during some FAQs, but I don't know if that's something that might be considered again, um, being able to adjust. Um, it's hard to be socially distant when you're on a space, a stage together. And Robert, feel free to unmute if you want to share your question comment more. Uh, yeah, I mean, we operate in a school in classrooms like a summer school, but our, our program is based on eight productions with casts of 30, which, you know, obviously needs to be readjusted and, and taken into consideration. But I haven't seen any guidance as far as what are the expectations around even holding performances of any kind? I know people locally are doing them with specialized face shields versus masks. Um, but I, I, there's lots of confusing guidance out there and, and locally people, are, people seem to be doing different things. So um, we need to kind of have a sense of what to expect before we enroll kids in something like that. Yeah, thank you, Robert. Thanks for that. That that this is a tough one um, because you know we've we've got the concern about uh, airborne transmission, which is not the major mode we think, but it's significant enough that um, that's why we're concerned about ventilation and people being close, even if they're wearing a mask. Um, and a face shield, of course, doesn't doesn't filter your air at all. So um, that we'll have to flag that as one that we'll definitely weigh in on and see what we can what we can do to. Um, potentially allow any kind of performance to, to maybe happen, um, but it, it is tough. Um, and we also have some existing guidance on um, music and performance, and it's um, fairly fairly restrictive at this point, but um, we'll, we'll look at that in terms of camps as well. So thank you. And I did, I, I think that's great to know. Um, last year, there was certainly discussion um, because there was differing guidance for just general like outdoor or general right like uh, gym facilities but it was made a point that if you were in a stable camp setting that the camp guidance was kind of took precedent over other guidance and so I think that it would be really important for people to know going forward assuming there will be camp guidance that comes out that that would be um you know, it was brought up that it might be very hard to do it by county because so many people travel even, you know, like the Tri-County, um, lots of other places that people would go and be going from place to place. Yeah. Thanks, Bethany. Yeah, we, we I remember us talking about it last, last year, so we can definitely make sure we're thinking about all of the activities. I would say, too, uh, we can dig up kind of our notes, but um, feel free as folks are kind of outlining. I remember we talked about ropes courses. We talk, I mean, there's so many incredible opportunities that I know you all put on. And I would say, feel free to remind us so that we are trying to think through all the different scenarios. We know you guys have to navigate and we'll try to be as comprehensive as possible in the guidance. And I'm also seeing a lot of questions in the chat about um, the childcare versus summer camp. So I would say right now, Yes, if you have kids who are five to 12 years old, you follow the, the child care guidance. We have not yet determined if that's going to be the process moving forward into the summer. So um, 
we will work with um, the Oregon Health Authority, the Early Learning Division, and folks on what that looks like. So I just want to be really clear that um, I know folks are kind of saying, what are the rules? There are no rules right now for summer. We don't know what it is. So I think, you know, feel free to start with what's out in the youth program guidance. Um, but we, we have not stated anything in terms of what to expect for summer yet. Um, so plan the way you need to plan and we'll continue to get up-to-date information out, but I don't want anyone to feel like we're, anything is guaranteed <laughs> at this stage. And I think there's just, there is a lot of um, people who are already planned or having people signed up. Yeah. And so is it, do they need to, in order to operate, plan to go through ECC process um, or it, is this gonna be something else, right? Where it falls within that they're exempt because they're a camp and even if, because they're a camp, they don't have to be ECC, but they still follow the guidance. I know that was a conversation that happened at one point as well. So I think this, this as soon as we're able to get that statement that if you are operating as an exempt program because you are a camp who operates for less than 80 days, you would follow this guidance, but you're still able to operate serving youth. If we could say yes on that, I think that would alleviate some um, worries and, and as, the sooner the better is my absolutely and then and lots of people tammy are asking Scott, go ahead oh i was gonna say uh, tammy please jump in i know there was a question about whether these registering as emergency child care requires a renewal i don't know if there's anything you want to just share on that in terms of the ecc process yeah so uh, if we're talking about unlicensed emergency child care there wasn't an expiration on that um, and then licensed emergency child care, you have your normal expiration that happens with your license. Hopefully the pandemic will be done before we have to start wondering about renewing it. It's always nice to be optimistic. Yes. I, I'm optimistic um, at the end. Uh, there's been a number of questions, Kathy, thank you for bringing it up again, around eating in programs. So I know, I think last year's guidance was really soft around it's best if people bring their own. And that was kind of it. The childcare guidance is definitely a little heftier in that category, but um, it's like, is it allowed? Is eating, do they, and there was someone who shared their example, they sit kids six feet apart, facing away from each other. Yeah, you look like you want to jump in. Well, I mean, the child care guidance doesn't say much. It allows for children to bring their own meals or for the facility to prepare it. And that's about as much as we say. Um, so I don't know where it landed on the camp guidance last year. Yeah, I think we, I know we'd um, revise and um, bring your own or um, you couldn't do buffet style if you had to do kind of like the family style someone had to serve. So I know we did get into a little bit of that last summer. Um, and I, I would say this is gonna be part of our review process across the board. So as we look at the guidance we put out last summer, what we currently have in youth programs, um, we'll kind of go through all of those sections of um, operation that we know really differentiate a, a camp from school um, in some ways or a childcare in some ways. Yeah, and I would say ECC also wouldn't, I mean, childcare just don't usually do buffet, but they do do family style, and we've said we can't do that. Mm -hmm. I've seen some really um, interesting and I think great points come up around, um, I guess, how to break down camps and having some possible like affinity groups or work groups on specific types of camps. I know I had a number of questions come in around camps on college campuses, particularly like sport camps or something like that, right? It's a very different than a day camp where you might go for this six hours, the same blah, blah, blah. Um, it's sorry to make that blah, blah, blah. Um, but uh, there's lots of different types of camps. Would it help for there to be some more specifics on different types um, versus a, a broader that's supposed to apply to all hundred varieties? Well, I think that's one of the challenges here is there's such a diversity of settings and sizes and activities that happen at camps. Um, 
we, we have the challenges. We want to make our guidance applicable um, and relevant to everybody, but we also don't want it to be a, you know, 100 page document if we can help it. Um, so I think we're gonna have to work on the scoping here and, and how much detail we need and um, how general it can be versus, you know, having a lot of specifics for different activities. So it's gonna probably be somewhere in the middle, but I, I don't know exactly right now. And um, as far as capacity wise, I'm, I don't know if it would be helpful because we've done this in the past, gather some feedback and make some recommendations for, you know, I stayed over here, if then, right? If you serve meals, then this would be our suggested accommodation uh, based on previous, you know, guidance and recommendations. If, if that was provided from certain affinity or work groups, would that be helpful? in being able to know whether that might be included in one bulk document or or separated based on sector. Um, Alyssa, Shira, what do you what do you think? I think that could be helpful. Yeah, I think the more information we have as we try to think about, I, I think the preferred approach is probably one, maybe two documents in part. So you're not trying to figure out where you fit also because you translate these into multiple languages. And if we update one, we might have to update 12 more. So from a consistency perspective, I think the fewer we could have, the better. So that being said, um, understanding the program types you're all operating, I think is helpful for us as we're thinking through all the, as many nuances as we can. And then I think, and Sharon sure, Alana jump in, you know, we've continued to do FAQ documents for other areas of guidance. So if we're not able to, you know, get as specific as folks need working with you all to, to have FAQs on those. Thanks, and a lot of good comments in the chat. Thank you, everyone. Um, for providing ACA camps info um, and all the kind of thoughts and recommendations on different sectors and, and how we might break up work groups. Um, uh, I did want to call note to the one of the questions around sharing spaces. And I know this came up a lot. And one of the questions that came in was, I think there was some back and forth on, are you allowed to share certain spaces or facilities within stable groups? Um, and that I think may have changed throughout the, from last May until currently, um, depending on what guidance it was. So I don't know where that falls now on, is that is that up for discussion? Would you like people to share examples on why or why not? They would need to be able to um, share spaces, right? What, what is the space and the thing that they're sharing? Would it be helpful yeah, to have any examples? Please, Tom. Yeah, um, so in general, I mean, the whole point of the cohort or the stable group is to, to minimize, um, you know, contact between different cohorts. That said, if you have a single bathroom, for example, um, I, I, I'm not too concerned if multiple groups are using the bathroom as long as they're not using it at the same time and there's, you know, appropriate um, cleaning and things like that. It doesn't, we're not super concerned that, um, you know, you would need to do like a full disinfection of a bathroom between cohorts, um, because again, we, we think the virus is mostly spread by droplets and in the air. So good enough ventilation, good enough spacing and time between groups is probably sufficient. Um, but again, we're trying to minimize the cohorts actually mixing um, and being in the same space at the same time. So that's usually our, been our approach. Thank you. And I think that this was brought up at some point around um, that that's very good guidance and what people I think tried to go with. Um, but if there is difference in understanding from local health um, or you know your building oversight. And so I think it's really good to, that we can, if we can clarify that in statements, I'll happily share that out with people. Um, there are some questions around um, swimming pools and transportation. Do we want to jump into those? Um, sure. Sure. Okay. So there was a number of questions that came up on transportation. Um, I think it is also um, 
piggybacking to whether or not there would be overnight camps and if any of those facilities would be able to in place do day camps that would require transportation to sites is something that we've heard come up a lot. Um, but the current transportation guidance is not very feasible for large groups of people. So what is the possibility that that might be updated at all or changed, you know, based on if it's a short enough ride that it's not a long exposure, it's your stable group anyways, you keep the windows open. Are there any of those possibilities? Yeah, transportation is uh, certainly a sticking point in a lot of settings. Um, and we have, uh, we've, we've had some kind of, we had a lot of discussions related to schools and, and busing, for example. And um, I, I think we settled on three feet um, spacing on buses as opposed to six feet, just because it was so impractical um, to have six feet spacing just given capacity and, and the number of, of vehicles and such. Um, you know, having windows open, um, is a big part of addressing the risk there. And then considering anybody who's on a vehicle together, that's like a whole, that's considered a cohort as well. Um, so I think we'll have to look about this, look at this with this, the specific uh, types of transportation that are used for, for camps. And so anything that, any particular questions you have or scenarios, we'll, we'll look at that as well. But um, it's, transportation is always a challenge. And I welcome anyone to unmute now and share their experience. There was certainly 15 passenger van questions that came up. If you do a kid every other seat at least, instead of like the three that it would, kids that you would only be allowed um, or less. Um, and buses, really school buses are frequently used as well. Yeah, if I could ask a question on that, it would be last year we had uh... 84 passenger buses, so the biggest bus, but the rule was only one cohort at a time, which was 10 kids. So it felt pretty empty putting 10 kids on 84 passenger bus. So is there ability, can we put a group in the front of the bus and a group in the back of the bus? Some options or considerations around that would be great. Yeah, thanks, Jake. That's certainly something we can consider. I know there was a particular question too on being able to utilize transportation um, to various sites, right? So it might be a short um, day trip, a short trip across town, but if you're taking your stable group in let's say a 15 passenger van, would that be, um, is there any way that could be allowable without using the three foot guidance if they're wearing masks and it's stable group and it's a fairly short trip? Yeah, so it's all again, this is all about mitigating risk. Um, the risk is not zero and everything we're doing here is just trying to, to minimize it within within reason. Uh, and so um, if a cohort is on a single vehicle, um, wearing masks, windows are open, potentially they could be closer than they would, we would otherwise want them, you know, so that's, that's one one way to, to look at it. Thank you. Um, just um, more questions on, on swimming pools in particular. So there was noted, would that be a space that you can share um, as in like one cohort at a time, but that you didn't have to drain the pool in between kids being able to use it at the facility? Right, yeah, COVID is not a, it's the, the virus is not waterborne. So uh, we're not worried about water per se, but really the same thing applies whether you're, you're outdoors in the air or in the water. Um, so I, I think if it's, a, unless it's a massive pool or it's a, a lake or something with, you know, you can really be spaced out. We're not gonna want more than one cohort at a time using it. Thanks. And then Sherry's asked again about bathrooms. So what I heard today, Sherry, and then I can be corrected if I'm wrong, is that being able to use the same bathroom for multiple co cohorts would be acceptable with the, um, contingency or with the assumption that they were not using it at the same time. So uh, it wouldn't necessarily even have to be an assigned stall per group, but more of an assigned time so that they were not interacting with one another directly to use that bathroom. Does that sound about right? You're not, you're muted though. Doc. Sorry. Uh, yeah, again, we'll have to 
think about some of the different permutations here. Um, because you know, if, you, if I, I'm just trying to think of settings where maybe there's only one set of bathrooms, um, and it, it might might be challenging there to say you're going to have a certain amount of time between groups if somebody just has to go to the bathroom. So uh, I think it could be a limit on the number of people in the you know if it's if it's a bathroom with multiple stalls, uh, just limiting um, the number of people who are in the bathroom at one time to to maybe one or a small number if it's a very large bathroom. Um, and and again, thinking about can we probably would not want more than uh, more than one cohort in the bathroom at a time. Uh, I'm not sure if we would have to be so restrictive as to say you can have a window of time when one cohort can be using the bathroom and then in a window of time when another cohort can be using a bathroom. But it comes down to just practicality and really again trying to trying to minimize the the mixing, uh, having people in the same place at the same time. And hand hygiene is, of course, very important around bathrooms, regardless of a pandemic or not. Yes, I think it'd be noted that you're also assuming that these youth are going to be washing their hands very well coming out of there. So shared surfaces would be mitigated by the fact they've washed their hands directly after, slightly at least. Um, and so there's more questions really on the timeline. Um, Alyssa, I just wanna make sure you see them. I know that you are not going to make a statement that you cannot live up to at this point, but um, there's you know recommendations on if there can be a date and, and to the point of, is there like a worst case scenario? You know, we're anticipating with things moving in a better direction that we would at least be able to have 10 person groups like we did last summer. And you know those kind of statements would be very assuring, reassuring for people as they're getting planned for this summer. Yeah, so I'm seeing the March 1st date and Ken, I think you emailed me that as well. So thank you. And so sharing that back with the teams and of course we've got our OHA colleagues on here as well. Um, Tom, I don't know if, I would say what my hope would be is the worst case scenario, but I don't know Tom, if you feel like we, we can say that there's any, if we can even say that we can assume that we're going forward with the way youth program guidance is, for example. Yeah, I wouldn't want to commit to anything now. We're, we're just yeah. we're starting this now. We're going to try to move as fast as possible, um, but we really want to do review um, some of the great evidence from, from, from the ACA, um, as well as other evidences out there and make sure it aligns with our um, other guidance and, and where we see things going in the next few months. So it's, there's a lot to consider. Thank you. And, um, and there was a question up there or a comment from Sabrina just about, you know, cleaning and, and all that. And yeah, I, I just wanted to say that for our school guidance um, specific to outdoor playgrounds, um, way back in the, in the first version of that guidance, we had something like clean, clean between cohorts um, and, and based on newer evidence, we, we no longer recommend that. We recommend routine cleaning of any out, outdoor um, structures. Uh, and we just wanna make sure that the important thing is that um, the children before they use the playground are washing their hands or sanitizing their hands and they're doing it after. And we're not worried about some kind of deep cleaning, especially outdoors. The virus really doesn't last very long outdoors um, in the elements. Uh, so that's, that's very low risk. Um, it's maybe a little different in bathrooms because it's not outdoors, but but even then, I think the most important thing is minimizing the number of users at one time and, and maximizing hand hygiene. Thank you. And um, we did have a question come up um, again around using school space. And so this to the to um, which guidance would someone follow? Is it more dependent on the space that they are in or the type of program they are running? So as a nonprofit in a school, do you follow camp or youth program guidance or um, K-12? I think that would be the, it would, it wouldn't, they would not be following the school guidance, um, especially I'm, I'm hoping that this scenario would assume that the school is not in session when they're using the school building. Um, so yeah, it would, it would probably be um, specific guidance to the activity as opposed to the, the building. Thank you. And, and another great question, I think around just as last year and, and guidance has done at some points of 
these are the al allowable activities at this point in time, and these are not allowable activities would be very helpful as so many um, camps and programs may want to pivot uh, at this point if they know that there is a low likelihood they would be able to operate, say, basketball camp. Yeah, um, sports were, I believe our sports guidance is, is in the process of being changing our, our general kind of statewide recreation and sports guidance so that that may be changing. Um, currently it's, uh, we do not allow any full contact sports. Um, that would be football, basketball, et cetera. Um, so yeah, stay tuned. And, and it's very likely that the the final guidance for camps is um, does it does name some specific things, particular types of sports or you know music performance, things like that, that we have particular restrictions on, just because of the unique um, uh, risks um, posed by those activities, which of course have benefits too. You know we're we're, we're concerned about the risk, but we we know that these camps are important for children and for families and. Um, there's a lot of benefits to having kids in camp. So we're, we're trying to have a holistic approach. Thank you so much. Um, there is a question around um, using public spaces. And I know that that was addressed in camp guidance last year. And so I just think reiterating the importance of that being able to use a public park, whether or not it is in complete open mode about using museum space or something else. Um, it would be good to make sure that that's included. Noted, thanks. And we're, I think just about at the end of time, please make sure you've dropped your questions in the chat box if we haven't gotten them today. It has been brought up, yes, there were more questions than probably solid answers, but we really appreciate all the feedback people have shared and hope that this will get us a little bit closer to some answers, definitely sooner than last year. And, um, yeah, Bethany, will you, will you be um, will you be kind of collecting some of these questions and passing them on to us, or would that yes. be possible? Yes. Okay. Uh, so this recording will be posted for any other person watching, and all of the questions I will pull together and send along to Alyssa and yourself and anyone else that would like them. Um, I'll also note that Michelle Copeland put her contact information in if you are interested in overnight camps. She will be doing some more work with that. So we, we didn't get a lot of on there, but there is that conversation still happening. So feel free to reach out to her as well. And if you would like, you're welcome to unmute yourself now because I think it's like the end of the hour and you can ask your question out loud or Yeah, I'll about. say I have to I have a five o'clock meeting. <laughs> Um, but just thank you all and Bethany, I know you'll send along all this great feedback and just appreciate you all for sticking with us and we'll get you answers as soon as we can. Um, feel free to keep sending them along. It's very helpful. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you. Thank you for being under fire today, Tom. Of course, yeah, and I'm, I'm sorry that we don't have a solid answer for you, but that's kind of by design because like I said, we are, we are in the early stages of actually finalizing this guidance. So we, we need to hear from you what your questions are. And that's, like I said, when we get that list and, and everything I've heard today, we will absolutely consider that all um, and try to, try to have a very, very clear guidance for you um, in the near future. Yeah, I think the iterative process is important since um, some of the guidance, you know, where it's like, maybe there has to be boundaries between groups and we're like, oh, we're on like hundreds of acres. Our groups are gonna be so far apart. We actually have to set up traffic cones, you know, on these hundreds of acres. And so there, the situation varies by uh, camp. So I really appreciate you all taking feedback. And if you didn't yet fill out that survey um, around the funding opportunity, please do. And feel free to send more questions our way.